Hello everyone, we got some good news for you. First of all, VChain is becoming ISO 20022 compliant. That's not such a big deal because I think every crypto sooner or later will become ISO 20022 compliant. And it's not really a crypto thing. It really won't affect the crypto market too much because it's mainly a messaging system, message format. Um, it just allows you to send more efficient information and it's really not the cryptos that are ISO compliant, it's the, it's the software and the messaging system. So if like two banks are actually using Swift, they're already ISO compliant. And because they're already ISO compliant, they can actually send transactions with any asset. Doesn't really matter if it's IS, the asset is ISO compliant or not because ISO compliance doesn't actually um, apply to assets. But if you're looking for uh, basically assurance that VeChain will be ISO compliant for some reason or other, uh, Binance Square has VeChain is on the brink of introducing account abstraction, elevating the utility of smart contract wallets. The VeChain Foundation's recent trademark filing for V3TR uh, trademark is setting the stage for compliance with ISO 20022 and expanding into global payments market and exhilarating development for blockchain enthusiasts and investors. Uh, VeChain has announced plans for, uh, to implement account abstraction AA in the near future. Account abstraction represents a significant leap forward in blockchain technology, offering a seamless integration of smart contract wallets. The integration is expected to simplify transactions and interactions on the VeChain platform, thereby accelerating the adoption rate of VeChain's blockchain solutions. They definitely need adoption, and not just in the industrial sense, but in the DeFi sense as well. Not really sure if this is going to help that. VeChain just needs to promote and uh, throw more funds at developers for this to actually happen. As VeChain continues to innovate, there's ongoing discussion within the community. This is all from Binance regarding the tokenomics of VeChain ecosystem, particularly concerning the VTHO token. And obviously, the staking rate is not great for that. Observers have raised concerns about the token's inflationary pressures. There is no max supply for VTHO and its implications for the network's long-term economic stability. The two-token sy system can actually work. But they, VET's like administrative team never really suspected people to, to speculate on the VTHO token, which was their big mistake. So I do think they're going to continue to manipulate VTHO to make sure that transactions aren't that expensive. So VTHO is probably not a great um, thing to actually invest in. Definitely has some pumps and dumps in there. But still, um, they're try but still, this is like decent news for VeChain. They want to align with the global financial communication standards. Uh, so if they want to use VeChain's e uh, communicate like messaging system, that would work as well. But like I said, like there's already like more than a couple of dozen cryptos that are ISO compatible, and VeChain's just joining that. So it's not such a big deal. I don't think it gives them like a big leg up on anyone else. But it's nice that they're getting compliance, so they can send financial messages back, even if they're uh, in even if they are using the VeChain system for messaging. So the filing for V3TR in particular indicates VeChain's intention to bridge electronic communications networks and electronic devices with the traditional financial system. So like, you know, for logistics and stuff and uh, to track payments and stuff, they might actually need this. It might be helpful in the future, but right now it really won't affect the coin. And I, like I said, I think most other networks, at least the big ones, are all going to become ISO compliant. So it's not nearly as big of a deal as uh, maybe some people would actually make out to be. Uh, but... I'm glad that they're doing it. Maybe it'll bring more liquidity and that would help the con smart contract platform a lot. Another news, the SEC has scored a small win against XRP. And I don't actually think this matters all that much um, because basically what Judge Torres, uh, not Judge Torres, Judge Netburn ruled is that uh, they basically won access to Ripple's financial info, info in an ongoing legal battle. And... Um, they basically like this is the case with a $1.3 billion in unregistered offerings and allegations. And like the SEC is just trying to get as much money as possible. So they want all of Ripple's financial information. And the judge has compelled Ripple to give it to him. This judge also was pretty favorable to XRP during the actual trial and determining XRP was not a security. But in this kind of like battle, she does say that uh, Ripple has to. Uh, fork over the information. Now, this actually might be good for XRP holders eventually because it'll give us more insight and detail into ODL if those documents are actually released to the public. And I'm going to think that there's really nothing in there that would really um, sting 
Ripple against the SEC, but there might be like some strategically valuable information in there that they w don't actually want to disclose. Plus, there's a lot of bad blood between the SEC and Ripple anyways, so they probably just don't want to give the SEC like any and all information that the SEC demands because the SEC has made some crazy demands. So essentially, um, Ripple must disclose his financial statements for both 2022 and 2023. We already have a lot of those. I mean, like he does give like an investor report. These statements will provide critical insights into the company's financial health and operations during this period. So they'll see like, you know, how much the money is from like XRP sales and all that stuff and like what exactly are institutional sales. Because remember, the SEC is trying to kill all the institutional sales. So they want to know what are actually the institutional sales. Ripple obviously doesn't want to disclose that information because there might be strategic importance to it. So there's going to be a lot of back and forth to this battle. Um, and John Deaton basically has said, like, he doesn't think a settlement is anywhere close. Uh, he obviously believes Ripple will win in the end, but he does not think that uh, settlement is anytime close. And it might last until, like, you know, the end of this year, possibly even stretch into next year, before there's a final ruling and a final amount that Ripple actually has to pay. I hope Ripple does well in this thing because this might set a precedent for other um, cryptos. And if Ripple has to pay a lot, that means other cryptos might have to pay a lot. And the SEC might be able to sue for mucho dinero. Um, from a lot of companies. On the heels of that, um, there's an XRP amendment that's almost passing. I'm not talking about the AMM, but XRP will allow reversible transactions because there's going to be a clawback amendment. Now, it has appealed to institutional investors, but it probably has not an appeal to know, crypto purists, but I don't think that really matters all that much. The institutional investors are the ones with the money. Obviously, like non-immutable transactions are like a big no-no point for idealists. I think like if you're going to deal with banks, you almost have to have this. Don't think this will affect price all that much, but um, yeah, it's over 80%, so it's going to be enabled. There's definitely going to be some resistance against it because, you know, like if, if you can claw back um, transactions, then the blockchain isn't really immutable. But this is definitely for regulatory purposes, and this is something that they really needed to do. So whether the purists like it or not, I guess that doesn't really matter. Of course, like cons, user autonomy, the clawback feature can allow issuers to interfere with users' holdings and complexity and user confusion. Implementing such a feature adds complexity to XRPL, especially for users with limited technical knowledge. But you know, they need to attract banks, they need to attract financial institutions. So I think this eventually had to be done because banks and financial transaction uh, institutions don't aren't going to really want to work with you that much if you don't allow a way to claw back funds in case of a mistake. So this could also be good because if you send funds accidentally to the wrong address, you can actually claw it back. But of course, you know, that brings up other problems of like, you know, people just trying to claw back for whatever reason. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of technical issues that could obviously come with it. And of course, fake KYC right now may be pawning regulators and also like exchanges. So there's this like place that's selling like fake crypto IDs that will get past KYC for $15. Now, I bet this place is going to get shut down very, very quickly because regulators will be on this like crazy. So they're using AI. So they're like generative AI. We all know what that is. You know, like it's killing the stock photo industry. And it's also using neuro networks to fake driver's licenses. And it's only $15 a pop. Um, the site only fake, which will be targeted by regulators and promptly destroyed soon, probably. Uh, and uh, it will actually fake driver's licenses from 26 countries, including the United States, Canada, Britain, or in, uh, Australia, and many other jurisdictions, and this is going to give regulators and exchanges a headache. So there was a media company called 404 Media, um, this is from Cointelegraph, and it showed today that it successfully bypassed the KYC verification of crypto exchange OKX using a photo of a British passport the outlet generated with the site. Now this is his, act this is his actual picture, but obviously like the information here is definitely fake. And OKX did verify it. I guess they don't have the government database available to actually verify this person. And of course, you can generate a passport like this one. This is obviously a fake one of Donald J. Trump. It says he's Australian. Um, and this is like his birthday, 46. Uh, I don't really know what that is. But of course, his race is uh, under race. It says orange. So obviously, this is fake. But if you have an AI scan of the passport, 
and they're trying to verify it, they are probably going to let this pass. Now, I don't really know how much good this would do to most people because most people actually use um, the KYC AML for a centralized exchange for an on-ramp, off-ramp type of thing. And realistically, like, um, if you connect it to your bank or your credit card, they have your information from your bank or credit card. So I'm not exactly sure how much good this is going to do. But I guess if you want just an account at uh, OKX, you can just submit a picture of Donald Trump, claim that you're from the orange race of humanity, and it will pass KYC AML. This is going to be such a headache for regulators. I just laugh at the consequences in thinking about it. So that's the news for today. Let me know what you think. Like and subscribe. Hit that bell notifications button. Thank you and have a nice day.